Hello, everyone. This is John Kogan, the CEO of Performative, the online community for corporate finance, accounting, treasury, and related professionals. I would like to welcome everyone to today's webinar entitled Managing Currency Risk in 2013, Volatility, Economics, Technology, and Regulations. In 2012, U.S.-based multinational corporations saw negative currency-related impacts to their financial statements well into the double-digit billions. 2013 promises to bring more of the same as volatility in global currency markets continues. Discover today the top three sources of currency volatility, uh, currency volatility to watch out for in the coming year as identified from in-depth research into hundreds of 2012 analyst calls. Today's webinar will include a discussion around what leading multinational corporates are doing to prepare for the volatility that will likely continue into 2013 with timely, accurate, and complete visibility into their fast-changing currency risks. We will also provide actionable insights into the macroeconomic trends that are driving volatility and receive an update on the changing regulatory landscape that is reshaping derivative accounting for U.S.-based multinationals. First off today, I would like to thank our sponsor, FireApps, with their wonderful support. We have fantastic content today, as always. Um, their support is greatly appreciated. So a great and hearty thanks to our friends at FireApps. Next up, a quick welcome to Performative. To those of you who are new to Performative, we're the largest and fastest growing online resource for senior corporate finance, treasury, accounting, and related professionals. We welcome you to check out Performative at www.performative.com. A few notes on today's event. A link to today's presentation and a link to uh, the video recording of this webinar will be sent out to all attendees within 24 hours. And the presentation itself is already posted at performative.com slash resources. Uh, for those who are here for CPE credits today or will be getting CPE credits today, we will ask three polling questions during the event. Uh, you must answer those questions. We would ask anyone else who's here to also answer those questions. Uh, they're statistical in nature. It's often very interesting to see uh, what the peers are doing uh, with regards to uh, the issues we'll be covering today. So please do participate in those polling questions. Please do ask questions as we go today. There is a questions box in your GoToWebinar control panel. Um, you can ask questions at any time. Uh, if we do not get to your questions during the Q&A portion of today's event, uh, the fine folks at Fire Apps or other panelists as appropriate will follow up directly uh, with you uh, via email uh, after the event. So please do ask questions as we go, and we're happy to help you get answers to those questions. Finally, after the event, you will be asked to take a short survey regarding today's webinar. We would greatly appreciate your feedback. We are always trying to do better. And this feedback helps us get better. Plus, um, during that uh, brief survey, uh, you are able to quickly request connections with today's sponsor, Fire Apps, or any of the speakers uh, from today's webinar. Uh, so that's a click of a button away. We have a number of learning objectives this morning that uh, we will be covering, and I won't read through these. I'll just let you take a quick scan. And beyond that, um, it is my sincere pleasure now to introduce our first speaker, Wolfgang Kester. Wolfgang is the Chief Executive Officer and co-founder of FireApps. He has over 25 years of experience in developing and implementing currency risk management programs for Fortune 2000 companies and governments. Wolfgang is a member of Global Finance's Who's Who in Foreign Exchange and a board member of ACI International, the Financial Markets Association. He's a frequent speaker at university and industry events and a regular contributor to industry publications, including The Economist, The Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, Treasury and Risk, and AFP Exchange, as well as networks such as Fox Business, Bloomberg, CNBC, and PBS. Wolfgang, welcome. Welcome. Thank you, John. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining today. I was really looking forward to today's webinar because it's a great time in early January to really think about what's 2013 going to look like. And really, with that, look a little bit backwards. Uh, I think we're going to go as far as back as at least seven years to some degrees but with a certain focus on 2012. And really, you know, looking at that, looking at those learnings and looking forward, Really, there are three consequences out of that one um, we're going to discuss. And I'm really looking forward to Carl, um, who's certainly a top uh, economist, looking at the macroeconomic trends as seen by him. Then really, secondly, um, really, we wanted to share today 
from a fire ass perspective, what are we hearing in the market? What are customers saying? What are they thinking about? What are they concerning about? And how they're addressing those concerns that they have? And as they address, thirdly then, those concerns, uh, what are the essential areas that they have to be thinking about from a regulatory environment who, and who better to do so than for Helen Kane to discuss that. So I'm really thankful for uh, both Carl and Helen joining us and at the end of this we'll certainly open it up to Q&A and um, I know I'm known to run over time and I think I'll, this time I'll stay very disciplined within my time frame today. So thank you everybody for joining. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that, uh, Wolfgang. And next up, um, we are going to go ahead and move into our first presentation. And our first presenter is Carl Shimada, who is Senior Market Strategist with Western Union Business Solutions and President of the Association for Financial Professionals Canada, Calgary. Carl is responsible for delivering market analysis tools and trading strategy to thousands of businesses across North America. He often speaks with financial audiences and is known for providing uniquely independent insights into the profound changes that are reshaping the global economy. Carl is a frequent contributor to a number of international finance magazines and his market perspectives regularly appear in media such as Bloomberg Business Week, Reuters, CNN, CNBC, and The Wall Street Journal. Carl, so happy to have you joining us this morning. I'm very happy to join everyone in here as well, and uh, and thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, and also, thank you to FireApps and Performative for the opportunity to join uh, today. I think uh, I think this is going to be a great discussion. Um, I really love the the timing of this event. Uh, you know, today the planet's most influential leaders are meeting in a little Swiss uh, ski resort to discuss the fate of the world. Uh, and as they do so, they will issue a series of forecasts and opinions that we're all intended to take very, very seriously. We're going to see those uh, those forecasts, you know, reported in uh, in the media for the next couple of weeks. But the reality is that most of them will be wrong. Uh, in 2011, the the French finance minister said that the eurozone uh, had turned the corner. Uh, obviously, flat wrong. Last year, guys like Soros and Rubini uh, jumped on the opposite bandwagon. Uh, and they forecast a disastrous 2012 for the euro area. Um, they said that currencies, uh, that countries would exit, that the currency would collapse, et cetera, et cetera. And they were wrong. Um, now today, uh, if you li if you listen to the uh, speeches being made, many of the same people foresee calm sailing ahead for the global economy. And the financial mir markets are, are mirroring this uh, this perception. They're extraordinarily calm, with most participants feeling optimistic about the global economy's prospects in the year ahead volatility expectations are at historical lows. Um, but as Yogi Berra put it, the future just ain't what it used to be, and it really never is. <laughs> it's unlikely that current expectations accurately reflect the future. Now, to be clear, I don't think that the global economy is about to fall into crisis. Um, the future really does look brighter than it has in many years. But currency movements are all about relative changes, not absolute ones. So some of the most dangerous episodes of currency market volatility are triggered in times just like these, when the global economy is undergoing a number of positive structural adjustments and market participants haven't yet priced those adjustments in. So I'd like to kick off today's session with an overview of the factors that are likely to cause havoc in the months ahead. And the idea here isn't to tell you what exchange rates will look like in the future, but to briefly outline the areas where current prices are vulnerable to realignment. And before I do so, it's important to look at how we got here, uh, really as Wolfgang was pointing out. As illustrated here, in the aftermath of the financial crisis, an incredibly simplistic global consensus emerged with the developed world trapped in recessionary conditions and the emerging countries recovering extremely quickly, the strategy was obvious. You borrow in the developed countries and invest in the emerging countries or invest in the raw materials that those emerging countries would need. The dollar and the euro plunged for two years after the crisis while commodity-linked and emerging market currencies soared. And this really touched off a lot of the volatility that we saw. Um, now, of course, whenever you've borrowed a lot of money in one currency and lent a lot in another, you're always going to be worried about a convergence between the two. If your borrowing position r rises in value while you're lending one falls, you're going to lose a massive amount of money. So we began to see what, what is often called the risk-on, risk-off trade. Uh, when traders were optimistic, they borrowed in dollar or euro and bought risky assets. When they weren't, they sold these off as quickly as possible and repaid their loans. Um, Given the size and risk associated with this trade, when growth rates and current accounts actually did begin to converge in 2011, we saw complete chaos in the currency world. The consensus collapsed. 
as you can see, commodity-linked and emerging market currencies underperformed. The dollar surged back as traders repaid their dollar-denominated borrowings, and then the euro began to do the same in the latter half of 2012. With no clear stories to trade on, speculators moved to the sidelines, uh, volumes and volatility plunged, and as we enter 2013, this really remains the case. Currencies are tightly range-bound, and speculative positioning remains extremely low. The euro provides an excellent example of this. Sentiment has improved markedly. Since the ECB president's commitment to do what it takes to resolve the liquidity crunch back in August, the number of people searching for information on the euro crisis has fallen dramatically, mirroring the developments we've seen in the financial markets. Short positions are a fraction the size they once were. So are the problems in Europe over? In a word, no. <laughs> uh, sorry to, to deliver the sad news there. The European economy continues to worsen, and I think you've all seen the forecasts that call for sub-zero growth in the coming year, so we'll focus on something else entirely. This slide illustrates the divergence that we're seeing between unemployment rates in the core and peripheral countries. Average jobless rates in the periphery have gone past the 19% mark, while core countries perform near their long-term historical averages. Europeans are feeling the pain, and even worse, it's not evenly distributed across the common currency area. Now, why is this important? because history tells us that these are perfect conditions for political upheaval. And I think this drives it home. We've seen support for the EMU, for the common currency, erode dramatically over the past year. People across Europe are turning against the common currency project. Um, and this, this means that these disenfranchised constituencies are ripe for the picking from a political perspective. Now, to be clear here, I'm not saying that the currency will collapse or even that countries will leave in the short term. In a financial sense, the common currency area is looking more stable by the day. Spreads are narrowing, target two on balance there are, one, are unwinding right now, and ECB liquidity is alleviating funding risk. Traders are repaying their euro loans and the currency is rising. But I do expect that electorates will begin supporting parties and leaders on the extreme edges of the political spectrum. As they do so, we are likely to see instability and volatility episodes in the financial markets, particularly around the regional elections that are scheduled for the coming months. So treasurers really cannot begin ignoring Europe just yet. The key is to watch the political arena to plan for some degree of upheaval and to remain protected in the event of an extreme slide uh, in the markets uh, or a sudden slide. Turning to the United States, this chart shows the evolution, evolution in the CBOT's VIX index, otherwise known as the fear index, over the last few years. As you can see, we're now trading at incredibly low levels. And this is despite the fact that we saw a volatility spike when we got down to the wire on, on December 28th. As debt ceiling negotiations progress, I would expect that we will see at least one more short-term spike outside of current ranges. If and when it does come, treasurers need to be prepared to capitalize on some very short-term trading opportunities. Beyond the, the, uh, you know, the political negotiations, I would strongly suggest, though, that the United States is in far better shape than many believe, and this is likely to cause an entirely different kind of upheaval. This chart illustrates the total commercial bank loan portfolio in the United States since the financial crisis. Over the past few years, I've been repeatedly saying that the Fed stimulus efforts were having little effect because the transmission channel wasn't working. Loans were falling, meaning that the average business didn't really see any of this easy money that everyone was talking about. But sometime in late 2011, this began to change in a sustained manner. Loans began to rise and to rise steadily. Money began to flow into the economy, setting the stage for outperformance. And this year, I think we'll see more of this improvement throughout the real economy as the circulatory system starts to work again. That being said, an improvement in the United States really isn't a recipe for smooth sailing in the markets at all. Quite often, it's the exact opposite. After years spent front-running the Fed's stimulus actions by driving yields down, traders are now running in the opposite direction, driving them up as they anticipate an eventual end to end easy money and as they rotate into growth assets. Uh, the bond bubble is going through a quiet collapse, and this is causing differentials between the dollar and other majors to to change. The dollar is losing safe haven demand while acquiring investment appeal, meaning that we should see continued strength and volatility, particularly as the ongoing euro carry trade unwind runs out of steam, which really brings me to the, to the major wild card out there. Um, here we can see the rapid rise in the Chinese yuan that has occurred over the past few years. And this is one of the most visible signs that China is rebalancing, but there are many other indications that the, China, that the, the country's income transfer system is starting to shift away from the fixed investment model that has served it so well for so long. Here's the key. As artificial mechanisms are removed, Chinese exports aren't growing as quickly as imports. Real rebalancing is occurring. 
Now this is a really good thing for the global economy and for the United States in particular. Balance drives sustainability, but it does come with a downside. As the country shifts from a strategic investment model toward a household income model, its appetites are changing. Marginal demand growth for raw materials is falling, helping to, to derail the secular commodity cycle that was touched off about a decade ago. Prices are far more volatile, and despite the renewed Chinese stimulus by stealth that is currently occur occurring, um, I would expect this to be the case throughout the year ahead. Now, the key here is to think about the fact that many of the safe havens we fooled into ourselves into thinking are safe are simply large commodity exporters, or China proxies, if you will. Um, I've highlighted a number of the currencies that are vulnerable here, and I expect that we'll continue to see an ongoing rotation of these out of these uh, throughout the year, and that correlations between them will dissolve. So treasurers would really be wise to look at individual fundamentals again. They will reassert themselves. The only question here is when. Now, before I hand the mic uh, back over, I'd also like to, uh, to briefly mention Japan. Um, Shinzo Abe, the, uh, the leader of the Liberal Democratic Party, was recently elected on a platform of economic change. He pledged to stimulate the economy through infrastructure spending and to drive the yen down by, by making the Bank of Japan print more money. Thus far, this has been extraordinarily successful. Um, as you can see, the yen has fallen off a cliff, but I'm more cautious than most. Uh, since the Second World War, Shinzo's party, the Liberal Democratic Party, has held power for all but six years. <laughs> Mr. Abe and, his, and most of his ministers only uh, held power just a few years ago. So, um, you know, why is this a cause for concern? Because I suspect that the economic change will not be as profound as foreign observers seem to expect. Weakening the yen and building infrastructure are classic parts of the LDP playbook, and they aren't likely to achieve dramatic transformation this time either. I believe that markets will eventually look to give tourists in the mouth, and we'll see a realignment in the currency markets when they do. Now, to be clear, none of this is doom and gloom. Quite the contrary. Um, many of the worst economic imbalances that affected the, the world over the last decade are actually correcting themselves, and we're creating a more stable future as this happens. But in the currency markets, we still need to go through an adjustment process. We need to adjust to a world in which fundamental realities are converging while outcomes are diverging. In other words, traders will begin trading on a differentiated basis that so will throw out the risk-on, risk-off playbook in order to capitalize on the opportunities that are being created. As this happens, volatility, volatility really will return, and many corporates will be unprepared for it. Um, and, you know, with that, I'll hand it off to Wolfgang, uh, you know, one of the world's best at, uh, at helping companies to thrive in this sort of environment. <laughs> And actually, for uh, just a moment before we get to Wolfgang, and thank you very much, Carl. That was excellent as always. Um, we do have our first polling question. So I'm going to go ahead and launch the first polling question. Uh, we'll leave this live for 30 seconds. The question is, which regions concern you most in terms of uncertainty and currency volatility in 2013? Uh, select all that apply. And uh, we appreciate, once again, um, for those who are here uh, receiving CPE credit, you must take this polling question, but to even those who are not here for CPE credit, um, please do uh, let us know what your thoughts are here. Um, we would uh, love to see what all of the highly qualified folks on the line uh, have to think about this question. I'll go ahead and leave this open for another 10 seconds, and then we will move on to Wolfgang. So a few more moments, and then we'll go ahead and close it down and move forward. So I will do that right now closing and moving forward. So I uh, had the pleasure of introducing Wolfgang a little earlier, so I won't repeat that, but I will now hand it over. Wolfgang, please take it away. Uh, thank you, John. I'm trying to still up. There it goes. Perfect. Uh, Carl, really interesting uh, comments on that. Thank you for that. Um, I think probably the thing to take away from this at the end of the day is that um, lots of things, lots of moving parts, Lots of uncertainty around there, and quite frankly, continuous ambiguity around what's really going on. I think that uh, all that will continue to, as you put it, uh, go through adjustment processes. And as we too up to lots of corporations, one thing is very clear, that they need to achieve anything possible to get to as predictable earnings as possible. So. Um, unlike the traders, as we all know, corporations really want to get more and more to become uh, currency agnostic, and, and we almost on a daily basis now are starting to see more and more companies going towards that. It's just too many things going on, too many moving parts, and really, um, you know, we see 
yes, we had a surprise of the yen, which I think was great that you put that in, coming in from uh, at the right at the end of 2012. Quite frankly, if I look back over the last 25 years, um, the Japanese were probably the best at manipulating their currency and always trying to find the most uh, um, uh, illiquid times to do so. So no surprise that they were doing that just before Christmas and right through New Year's and certainly are making noise towards get to 100, which has, as, as uh, mentioned uh, um, end of last week on Bloomberg, significant implications on lots of different industries. The Japanese car manufacturers would be very happy at 100, but uh, the CEOs of the US car manufacturers are going right to the president and saying this is, this is going to be hurtful. But at the end of the day, I know that the vast majority of the over 300 corporations on this, uh, on this uh, uh, call today are really focused about, well, what do I do about this? And um, so but as we go through that process, there's four real topics that we continue to get discussions about that I would like to also address. Some of them you already started addressing, Carl. Uh, one is China. And really, this is a this is a very interesting perspective with a lot of, and probably all through 2012, probably top of mind from a risk point of view, economic risk point of view, and currency risk point of view. And the issue here is really that, you know, China started trying to free flow their currency from 2005 to 2008, and then stopped pretty rapidly. And uh, we'll go a little bit more into uh, one country in particular that years ago did a very good job, and a lot of companies don't do a very uh, sorry corporate comp countries don't do a very good job at actually uh, managing the free flowing of a currency, and there's significant risk associated with that that can that can uh, create volatility. But one thing is for sure. China unpegging their currency, freeing and increasing their bandwidth will do nothing but increase the volatility towards all currencies. Secondly then, we'll talk about the euro a little bit. Third of all, I'm sure everybody's reading this continuously, there's currency wars going on here where not just the major, the Japanese, the Europeans, the, the Americans are talking about their currency. Russia is talking about the currency. We saw a previous uh, slide about you know, where are some of the risky things? Brazil is outright coming out and talking about the currencies. So lots of different currencies and their interrelationship. And then lastly, what to watch for is we continue to see consolidation in treasury software vendors. And what does that really mean? You know, we've seen over the last couple of years companies buying uh, technologies and then, quite frankly, sunsetting it and saying we're not going to support it. And, uh, you know, now you need to go to another software. As you're seeing these acquisitions, as I'm sure some of you have seen them, uh, make sure that really uh, you understand the implications of who you're associating you with and who your long-term planning is. So let's spend a little bit more time about Chile, uh, China. And really, over the years, I've actually met with uh, former Governor uh, Corbo from Chile because I was really interested in studying all his currencies, how he was able, to, um, over the many years that he was in charge, able to unpeg the currency and do that in a very methodolo methodological fashion and very controlled to the point that it was actually a very good thing for their country and remains a very good thing. And you compare that Argentina, who, for example, didn't do such a good job on that. And you can see here, while the charts show up, it's really a deep, a rapid depreciation of their currency in Argentina, whether the, while on the other side is a very controlled area. And the danger with Chile is that they started it in a controlled environment. Um, they stopped, and now they're starting again. And the question is, is this going to go more towards um, is this going to go more towards Argentina or Chile? The risk is absolutely evident and here. And given that they had stopped and now are restarting it with a new government in place, there is a risk that they may do this too slow. And that at the end of the day will create economic pressure that at some point could blow like it did in Argentina. Now let's look at the next step at um, Europe. I spent a lot of time there. I'm back over there on February 4th, 5th. And um, there's a real danger that Merkel could have the same fate that uh, Sarkozy had, where he was very pro-Europe, we're going to protect the euro, et cetera, et cetera. And only six weeks prior to the election changed his mind on that. By that time, it was too late, and he lost the elections. Uh, Merkel, just over the weekend, as many of you have seen, one of the major states 
Sachsen or Saxony in uh, in in English um, really lost her party lost in that state. That's a state that usually was carried by hers. So she really has to watch out. Is what does this euro really mean? The majority of Germans, as I'm seeing them, a lot of them are really worrying about that this is just going to be too costly. They can't afford it, and there are others there. So. Um, to Carl's point, from an economic point of view, I, I also agree that, and I think I just saw a poll, I think it was a Wall Street Journal poll, talking about that 80% or 87% of people did not believe that the uh, euro was uh, out of problems yet. So probably continuously watching that, that's going to continue to have volatility on that side. Again, companies really need to understand those exposures in order to manage that risk to a acceptable level because that volatility is going to increase. As we then move on to the next area, um, really looking at what does that mean? As we have these currency wars, not only thinking about China and Europe, who are not as blatant about saying we're in this war, um, and the United States so far staying away from that war to some degree, they don't really have that much to lever to decrease their dollar. Um, the value of if the dollar continues to go up and everybody else is chasing the their currency to go down to be more competitive is going to really start having an increased amount of a, a impact that could come just about from any area in the world so the res the prudent response is back to being ready for just about anything so as one looks at this and as we've seen it over the many years um, I really seen a, a trend that has two outlooks. One is, am I still doing what we were doing in the 90s and maybe in the early 2000s? And if I'm expecting the same results, given this increased volatility and uncertainty, that's probably a not, a, not a great expectation. In those years, in the 90s up to the mid-2000s, it was OK to, on average, be maybe 65% um, managed towards the risk side or 65% hedge. Today's world, that's not good enough. That is going to really hurt and increase volatility. So investors are obviously thinking about, OK, historically, the volatility from currencies has been x. We never want it to be worse than x. But given the environment, it's if one doesn't change the processes and adjust or improve those processes, that x is going to be larger and that the analysts aren't going to like. They are asking harder and harder questions about it. So they're driving also, as well as boards, um, the change towards improving the processes. So really starting to focus then on how do you know that and what do you know about the currencies. And currency companies more and more are getting to become a currency agnostic, as we mentioned earlier. And as, as many of you know, currency agnostic we define as managing currency uh, risk to a point that it really becomes immaterial. So when I look then back over the last seven uh, years or so, there used to be a discussion about, well, you know, what, what is my dollar, for example, yen exposure? And then that would be a discussion. Then that discussion about five years ago moved to, what is my yen exposure against all currencies? Or what is my euro exposure against all currencies? And now we're seeing that people recognize that their top five um, exposures against one currency is just not the majority of the risk anymore. As companies are going increasing the international, they're asking more and more the question is, what is the entire portfolio of currencies is, and what is the risk associated with that portfolio and how is it going to impact my financial statement? So clear trend here over the last seven years from looking at one currency pair to looking at one currency against a lot of different currencies versus looking at an entire portfolio of currencies and impacting them at all. Very clear trend here. And I think that uh, Brent here on this slide said it very well. He said, uh, um, you know, you might, a lot of those currencies, a lot of large moves in very small currencies can bite you harder than um, one large move in one major currency. So the end then is, one of the things that people are starting to think about is, OK, if I understand the portfolio of currencies impacting my financial statements, is there, as we know from portfolio theory, um, an efficient frontier? How should I look at the risk versus the reward? So it's not uncommon. This is a $1 billion company here who uh, charts their entire portfolio of currencies from a risk factor. So you see on the y-axis here, in this case, they have $16 million of 
value at risk of their portfolio of currencies if they did nothing? And then what is the cost interest rate, in this case differential, cost associated with managing that risk to uh, maybe little to nothing? So a pretty important tool to really go back to letting people understand what the portfolio of currencies is and what the risk reward associated with it. And that's very doable in today's world. Technology can certainly provide that. And the importance here is to really understand what the entire portfolio of currencies is. So upgrading the portfolios within a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous uh, environment is important. And expanded the analytics around that. And I think in many other areas also, not just currencies, everybody understands and sees that you know what, analytics, we need to now understand the data better, not just have the data at hand, but what are the analytics around that so that when we can really understand what is involved in that. And as mentioned, and for example, earlier, is you know the analytics could be around what does my balance sheet look like at the end of the quarter, or I may want to look at my forecast versus my actuals in this. So managing that program's performance to a, an acceptable risk and defining that better is really important here. So um, with this, I'll give it back over to uh, um, um, John with obviously looking at this. So please go ahead, John. Thank you so much. Appreciate that and great insights, Wolfgang. Uh, at this point, we're going to go ahead and launch the second of our three polling questions. Uh, so you will be seeing that momentarily. This question is, how many currency pairs do you believe are creating currency exposure in your company? Um, select one. And uh, you can see the selections uh, there. Uh, I'll take a moment right now to remind folks that um, if you have any questions to ask of our esteemed speakers today, please do so via the question area in your GoToWebinar control panel. Um, it's uh, probably right there below where you're taking the polls. And you might have to expand it uh, in order to see it. But we welcome all questions, so please uh, bring those on. I'll leave this polling question open for another five seconds, and then we will close and go on to our third brief presentation. So I'm going to close that right now. And it is my pleasure to welcome Helen Kay. Helen founded Hedge Trackers LLC in 2000, and since that time has worked with hundreds of corporations and financial institutions to implement or refine GAAP-compliant hedge programs. Helen's technical knowledge has been codified into Hedge Trackers derivative accounting software and outsourcing services. Helen has chaired both the East and West Coast annual derivative accounting conferences sponsored by CPE Inc. since their inception in 2004, and is a frequent guest speaker at technical treasury and accounting forums. During the 1990s, she led the Deloitte and Touche Silicon Valley risk management practice focused on hedge program development for multinational corporations. And prior to Deloitte, Helen served in treasury, finance, and accounting roles for multinational corporations. Helen, so glad to have you with us this morning. Thanks for joining. Thank you, John. And thank you also to Fire Apps for the opportunity to present today with Wolfgang and Carl. Uh, my topic is going to be a little less intellectually stimulating um, and a little bit more urgent uh, call to action today as we start talking about Dodd-Frank. And rather than volatility in currency, we're talking volatility in legislation. I, I wanted to kind of start out uh, just talking about the Dodd-Frank environment where it uh, seems a lot of uncertainty reigns. Um, basically, we've had a lack of clarity, um, and I think coming from really a lack of understanding by the legislature, that has really kind of produced a lack of appropriate you know, reg regulation that had to be prepared but hasn't been. You'll notice on the slide here that we still have 129 Dodd-Frank rules that have not even been proposed. Um, we're looking at 40% of the rules that actually have been finalized so far. Um, we've seen, you know, really a stunning lack of compliance, which is why I'm calling you all to action today. Um, at the end of the year, there was a an original deadline for folks to be, you know, kind of Dodd Frank ready. And basically, uh, what the counterparties or swap dealers, um, which are kind of your banks and and folks that you're trading with, had reported that less than 18 percent of you had gone through step one. Um, of you know, being compliant and ready to trade at year end. Um, as a result, the deadline was moved out to May. We'll talk more about that later. But 
you know, really what we're seeing is a shocking lack of compliance by end users. And this actually resulted in uh, the delay when the swap dealers went back um, to the regulators and said, um, basically, we have 1% of our counterparties that are going to be prepared to trade January 1. So um, very uh, concerning numbers, uh, you know, clearly a lack of understanding by everybody of, uh, of what we're required to do. Um, just kind of to give you a little bit of an update on where the uh, regulators are with respect to writing regulations, I've kind of highlighted here um, from this presentation that Davis Polk has done. Um, on the derivatives line, you can see that we've still got um, 10 substantial rules that need to be presented to um, and, and finalized um, that are specific to, um, to derivatives and derivative use. And on this second slide, uh, you can see that there hasn't been a lot of action. The, the green lines there are kind of showing you what rules have been finalized or proposed for fi finalization in a specific period. And you can see not a lot was happening in 2012. And people seem to be distracted and working on other issues other than, you know, frankly, legislation around, you know, the Dodd-Frank rulemaking. So there's still kind of a lot of uncertainty out there about the rules. The next element, though, has to do with you as end users. And what we're seeing is that many of you think, well, these rules don't apply to me. Kind of some of the most frequent excuses that people use to kind of scope themselves out is, I only trade plain vanilla Ford currency contracts. Or I qualify for the end user exemption. Or my foreign subsidiary does all of our trading, so I'm not too concerned. Well, what I'd like to do is take a look at some of those exceptions or exemptions that you think you have and, and help you understand why, uh, why we still need you to participate in Dodd-Frank. Uh, first of all, for those of you who only do plain vanilla forward contracts and, you know, therefore, um, you know, fall under the kind of scope exception for um, clearing, I need you to know that what that did is that actually kind of moved you into the automatic end user bucket. That means that you will be exempt from clearing, and clearing basically, um, when we're talking about clearing here, we're talking about the requirement to post margin. And you're also exempt from getting board approval uh, to take the end user exemption. That's what you are exempt from. What you're not exempt from is adherence to the ISDA protocols. And these basically allow counterparties to report on the trade prices that you've got. The big problem with not adhering to the ISDA protocols is that if you don't adhere, they won't trade with you. So it's very important here to get your paperwork in place so that you can um, have counterparties that will actually execute transactions with you. Uh, there are know your counterparty requirements that your, um, your banks, they have to know about your company. And without the information about your company, again, they can't trade with you. There are safe harbor elections for the banks and the providers. Um, that you have to determine whether or not you are going to protect them via safe harbor or not, um, decisions that you have to make that they'll want to know so that they know what their obligation is to you. Um, and there are various reporting requirements, not necessarily that you are subject to, but your counterparty is, and they need your adherence so that they can report on your transactions. Most of your ISDAs right now, for example, preclude your counterparty from reporting on what price you executed the trade at. And this, um, this is what they need from you in order to be able to, um, to execute trades with you. So what about being an end user? You know, um, end user exemption hasn't really kind of come into place yet. Um, you haven't really kind of needed to register yet as an end user. But it's important for you to know that what you're going to be exempt from, again, is the posting of margin. Again, you're not exempt from adherence to the protocol um, and the know your party requirements. In this case, you will have certain board approvals that you will need to get, i.e., can we get the end user exemption, which is 
a, an election made at the board level. You have additional board approvals that are going to be associated with any safe harbor elections that you may be making. Um, and then you have actually making those elections and the related reporting requirements. And then those of you who are um, saying, well, I'm not too concerned because you know, all of my trading happens at my international sub dealing with offshore banks. I just want to highlight to you here kind of some of this bolded language uh, about who is a US person under Dodd-Frank. Right now, um, and, and we won't know the final outcome until July of this year, but the CFTC has proposed that branches and agencies of a person will have the same US person status as the principal entity, i.e. your subsidiaries, or another proposal that they had would be that business organizations, majority owned by US persons, or the owners are responsible for the obligations of the entity, would qualify as a US person. And all US persons are going to be subject to the Dodd-Frank regulations. So um, keep your eyes out, even those of you who are doing everything offshore and, and think you may be exempt. Uh, you may be, you may not be. Um, I did want to kind of quickly um, talk to you about what an ISDA protocol is, what it is that we're asking you to do. And frankly, a protocol is just a mechanism for corporations and banks to universally change existing ISDA or other credit type documents um, to make a universal change. The first time that they did this was for the euro. Everyone was going to be moving from you know, specific currencies to the euro, so they allowed um, everyone to do it mechanically and again with um, some of the, the rights for reporting, et cetera. That's what we're looking at when we talk about the Dodd-Frank um, protocol. So hopefully you've determined that the Dodd-Frank protocol does impact you. Um, and I just wanted to kind of give you your new deadline. It's no longer uh, June, it's no longer um, December 31st. Um, the deadline's been moved out to May 1st because of your stunning lack of compliance. <laughs> They've given you more time. And what you have to do to, partic you know, to participate as a corporate is you've got to jump in and deal with your adherence letters. You've got to qualify yourselves. You have to provide information um, to your counterparties about you. You need to um, get the appropriate board level approvals. You have to make determinations about safe harbors. And frankly, uh, look at what rights it is that you have as a, um, as a corporate and what protections you have under Dodd-Frank. John, I think it's back to you at this point for a quick question on Dodd-Frank preparedness. Um, we have a number of questions coming up. We do have our quick poll question here, and uh, that will be opening in just a moment. So this question, where are you on Dodd-Frank compliance? <clears throat> And we just saw some alarming statistics there. Um, while folks are um, taking a shot at answering this, uh, I'll go ahead and uh, encourage folks to please ask questions um, via the question section of your GoToWebinar control panel. I'll also take a moment to remind folks to please stay on board through the very end of the webinar so uh, we can get your feedback in the survey that we present uh, at the end of the webinar. Also, in that survey, um, with the click of a mouse, you can request to be connected with uh, Fire Apps or any of the three speakers today. And with that, I'll leave this open for another five seconds, and then we will hop into our panel discussion. So I will close the question down now. And next up, panel discussion. We have a number of questions, but please feel free to keep them coming. As I mentioned earlier, anything that doesn't get uh, answered right now, the folks from Fire Apps or appropriate uh, panelists will follow up on later. And the first question is for Carl. Uh, how, Carl, how might a decline in the oil price affect the financial markets and the global economy? Uh, that's a really, really interesting question, and, and it's and it's kind of cool too because I think a lot of people aren't paying any attention to uh, to the oil price anymore. Back in two thousand and eight, uh, you know, and 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 even prior, that was a primary focus for many people in the markets. Um, you know, and the oil price really is of crucial importance for the global economy. I recently did some research on uh, on global current account balances and found that the transfer of wealth from the developed world 
into the uh, into the oil exporters vastly outweighed the China imbalance over the last decade. Um, you know, in, the, in recent years, you've been looking at something like half a trillion dollars uh, in a in a year. Um, ironically, much of that surplus uh, that those oil exporters were generating uh, was recycled into U.S. securities, uh, and that meant that the dollar was artificially boosted uh, while yields were were depressed, and that subsidized U U.S. spending. It almost forced uh, people in the United States to spend on imports, um, and arguably that caused many of the problems that we're dealing with now. Um, so if we do see, you know, the oil price fall, uh, you know, and, and not continue to climb, or even flatline in the future because of increased unconventional production or, uh, you know, slowing marginal demand growth from the emerging world, much of that imbalance might erode, and that would potentially send yields and the dollar upward, which would also, of course, have ripple effects across any uh, any currency portfolio that you might have. And frankly, I think that outcome is kind of uh, quite plaus plausible here. Um, so I think that market participants should be looking at oil dynamics in the year ahead almost as closely as they currently watch currency dynamics. Um, you know, and really to underline that, I think that the, uh, a drop in the oil price is almost the perfect definition of a tail risk at the moment. Almost no one expects it, um, and almost no one is prepared for it. Uh, Wolfgang, uh, you know, feel free to tell me I'm crazy. <laughs> um, what are your thoughts? No, I, I don't think you're crazy. I think that this just goes right back to how complex the world is today. So I think it's really good that somebody asked the questions about oil impact. So, you know, may, maybe one of the other questions will be about gold and the other will be about silver and commodities in general. Um, fact is that they will have so many potential outcomes that I'm going to go back to saying uh, volatility is there, direction, uh, most, no, not most, none of our customers are in the business of speculating of whether it goes one direction versus the other. So given that this is another uh, risk that can be left to in and is being left to interpretation and to market forces, uh, fact is that uh, really need to stay away from that risk and make sure that no matter what happens to oil, uh, you're not impacted. Helen, do you have anything you'd like to add to uh, those comments? You know, just quickly, I think we're just seeing the increased integration of currencies and commodities. And, you know, for those of you who have been watching currencies for years and, you know, you're, you know, you recognize the volatility there, I, I'd only like to suggest that commodities and the fact that that linkage is happening only increases that volatility, increases and should increase your kind of concern and your uh, need to, to monitor that. Great, thank you. Uh, next question actually is for Helen. Um, so the question, Helen, is are the SEC delays on Dodd-Frank rulemaking indi indications that the rules are being watered down? Um, you know, I, I actually look at the delays a little bit differently. I think um, part of the delays are, are a function of uh, the legislature's kind of lack of understanding a, how derivatives work. You know, you can just look at that in the some of the terminology that, that they use, um, the fact that they don't really distinguish between a, a are they, they're distinguishing between a deliverable forward currency contract and a non-deliverable forward currency contract as, you know, one of them wouldn't be subject to the rules. Um, I think that that's kind of followed by either a lack of interest or maybe what I'm seeing is more of passive-aggressive reactions by the regulators you know, how to deal with people who don't really understand the markets and people are legislating around that. And you know, and then it, it's kind of being followed up by kind of a stunning lack of engagement by corporate end users. Um, really, the message isn't getting out that if you want to trade past the deadline, you need to, you know, you need to play ball and really just getting that word out to corporate. So uh, I see the delays as, you know, a reaction kind of to the either passive aggressive or lack of interest in, in the regulator level, but then really because corporates aren't engaging. I, you know, they're busy elsewhere and, and not really noticing what's going on on the Dodd-Frank side. Interesting. Wolfgang, do you, uh, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, I think that there, I am actually not as surprised as the lack of participation. I think that um, you know the typical thing for a corporation is to really await from banks and lawyers to tell them what to do. And um, but 
there is a significant shift of thinking here because at the end, people are not, corporations typically are not speculators. Speculators are very much used to this sort of regulatory environment, putting up margins and all these sort of things. But in the corporate world, unless you have a you know, not very strong balance sheet, you're probably not having to put up margins. You don't have to go through all these areas. So there's a significant shift that's being required that, quite frankly, I'm not sure that Frank Dodd really thought through. They're, I think, listening a lot to um, the experts who are financial wizards or are already very active um, participants. But you know, you're a $500 million revenue company um, that you know really has no interest of participating in the markets except for using plain vanilla. And I know that there's some exemptions to that plain, plain vanilla. Um, forward contracts, for example, just to make sure that they can manage it. You know, there was a Wall Street Journal article uh, probably four weeks ago now where a small company in New York was talking about uh, how they're acquiring cheese and how they're reselling the U.S., but most of cheese is coming from France, so you have euro exposure. This is a company that has less than $5 million of, of euro exposure, and now they're supposed to manage it, and now they're supposed to go under this. I know that there are size exemptions, all these sort of things, but there's a significant shift in thinking that the government and the legislators think is just going to happen just because we're going to force it. And I, I think it's a bit unfortunate that this was, you know, quite frankly, a bit miscalculated and is, uh, you know, very, I'm, I'm not seeing all the benefits just by adding regulations, but that's, that's my thought on it. Mm. Carl, anything you'd like to add there? Well, um, you know, in all honesty, <laughs> I had to kind of laugh uh, when Helen said earlier that this stuff was not as intellectually stimulating as uh, as what we were, as what Wolfgang and I were talking about. Uh, frankly, I think it's uh, much more intellectually stimulating and uh, and more difficult. Um, you know, and I can't speak directly to the regulatory uh, changes that are occurring, but the one thing that I think is somewhat of a positive coming out of it is that corporates are paying attention uh, to you know the foreign exchange exposures to uh, the types of instruments that they use and as a result you're seeing uh, you know more knowledge being built up in-house um, rather than as Wolfgang suggested there um, by relying on partners and, and I think this is really really important because it's one of the competitive disadvantages that uh, American companies have had for a very long time is not understanding that they are operating in that global environment that they do have currency exposures uh, that they have exposures in many areas, um, and that those things need to be managed. It's you know not all clear sailing ahead. Um, so yeah, you know I think it's I think it's a positive in a, in that sense that uh, that it's bringing the focus back. Great. Okay, thanks for that. Let's move on to our next question. This is for Wolfgang. Uh, the question is, how can multinationals better understand the currency impact on planned versus actual results? How much of that variance is due to volume uh, versus rate changes? Awesome. Well, that's a we got a great great audience here. This is a great question. That's a pretty intuitive question. You know, that's interesting because I wonder where that comes from a European corporate. Because two out of three European corporates uh, we're talking to um, currently, they ask almost exactly that question. So what they're trying to understand here is obviously this is going more towards looking at your revenues and expenses and forecasting it. And the existing processes are, well, I look at my forecast, I execute on the forecast, then I, then I look at um, what my next forecast is, adjust it, and manage it. And you know, sometimes I think of that as being, well, if you keep doing the same thing, why do you expect different, different results? So there is a continuous interest on two levels here from that question. One is, OK, I look at my forecast. Is there a benefit of actually understanding my actuals? And the clear answer to that is yes. Because if you're getting a forecast, and I get this all, you know, for the company we, all the companies we talk to, you get this all the time where somebody says, look, I'm forecast, I'm going. I had a conversation yesterday with the treasurer of a, a large corporate. And they were getting their forecast out of Romania in Romanian lei and in dollars. And reality is that they had euro revenues in there, but they kept getting their forecast only in Romanian lei and in dollars, and therefore were never going to improve their actual exposures. So, so the first question then is, how do I get a better understanding of really what is going on? And when you say the word really going on, you need to go and also look at your actual. So you need an analytic environment where you can look at the forecast to forecast as well as actual to forecast and learn from that to improve the processes. 
The second question that comes out of that, which we're getting now a lot because of what just happened with the yen, people are asking the question, yen against all my currencies, what actually, um, when I look at the currency impacts to the financials, and we're going to have the yen week next week coming out with all these corporates that are largely going to be impacted with yen starting to, re to report, is as they're looking at this, how much of this is actually related to the move of dollar yen, for example, 77 to 85, and how much is that is actually that we didn't have the volume forecast the way we want to. So two-tier question here. One is you got to look at your actual source of forecast as well as your forecast to forecast, but the actual to forecast is going to start giving you a better idea. And you would be amazed how many companies we talk to that don't readily have that actual to forecast available. Lots of companies are using cloud-based technology to really get to that actuals. Talked to a company earlier today. They said, "Yeah, well, we have kind of actuals in our SAP system, but finding those in our 41 subsidiaries and aggregating all this is a task that we can, you know, we to be quite honest, can only do once a year. So actuals to forecast is a very difficult task for most co corporations to do. And then secondly, what part of that is volume and what part of that is actually rate change is an important aspect of this. A really great question on that." Great. Thank you, Wolfgang. And um, at this point, we actually are, are um, out of time for Q&A. Now I can see we've got 10 plus questions queued up. Um, so once again, the, the fine folks at Fire Apps and the other panelists, as appropriate, will uh, reach out afterwards and we'll help coordinate that so folks get their questions answered. Uh, and now that leads us to a few final slides here. Number one, those conclusions. And back to you, Wolfgang, please. Yeah, thanks for that. And I'm going to make this really quickly. I hope that everybody out of this sees that there is significant volatility in here and there are currency wars. You're seeing the rhetoric almost every single day. I think the other thing to do is while all that's going on, you know, we are very strongly the belief and see that on an almost daily basis that more and more companies saying, look, I, I don't have a crystal ball. I, I don't need it. I don't, shouldn't have a crystal ball. I shouldn't even think about it. Is I know I'm going to expect the unexpected and at the end of the day I need to manage by improving the processes to get to at least equal, if not better, uh, risk management levels, but at least equal, which is, I think, the interesting part here. I think, Helen, thank you so much for the insights of Don Frank. It is, I think, probably very surprising to many how little compliance there is on that point of view, and you know, really understanding user and end user exemptions are very, very important. To win in a VUCA world, you need best-in-class capabilities, and the interesting part is that these cloud-based analytics that are way, uh, available today are really changing the environment. This used to take, you know, two, three, four quarters to change and adjust. Re really, right now, you can have results within days, not months. You don't really need IT to significantly. I mean, I, I hear all the time now, well, that's not really an IT project. You only need three, four hours of IT to get through this and get to the analytics to actually improve my processes. And then this is proven by all sites of companies. You know, the um, Alexander Hamilton Awards recently was won by a mid-sized company for the first time ever because a mid-sized company was able to achieve what before was only achievable by the largest companies in the world. So thank you, everybody, for the participation. So you may okay. wonder. Would you like to comment on this as well? Sure, absolutely. I mean, I think that there's a lot of information on there. Of course, I'm going to say on, on Fire Apps on our website. We really work very hard to keep everybody up to date, but certainly also on the on the performative side, there's uh, white papers talking about more depth about the currency storm. Um, there are case studies out there that can reference even with companies that may not be a household name like Google Accenture that can reference how one can get there. Um, so there's lots of blogs. I encourage you to be in there. We're very active of keeping people up to date. So as you think about 2013, one of the things that I would encourage you to do is, you know, what else is going out there? We, you know, we are very active in letting people know via blogs what's going on. And we, you know, we're going to focus on the yen week next week, for example, with earnings going on. Um, great video that just came out with uh, stocks focus, increased focus by the press, uh, media on currencies impacting earnings per shares and lots of case studies to, uh, that, uh, that I can encourage you to listen to on YouTube to make it easier instead of reading them as well. I'm really thankful for our existing customers as well as prospects interest of that and performative as well as Carl and Helen. Thank you so much for your insights on that. Really appreciate it. 
And uh, I'd like to uh, second uh, Wolfgang there. Thanks so much to all the speakers uh, on today's panel. And actually, while we're on this slide, uh, truly the content on the Fire app site is um, second to none. It's incredibly high quality and insightful. So I certainly encourage people to check that out. Um, we have uh, a couple quick items to hit uh, before we uh, get everyone to that quick one-minute survey. So I appreciate you hanging on here for an extra minute. Um, so you will uh, see that quick survey as soon as we shut down this webinar. If you have any questions at all about CPE credit, please contact Chris Brower. You can see uh, her contact information there at the bottom. Uh, of the slide, uh, a quick note here for Formatech, we have a wonderful finance, accounting, treasury and related conference, a uh, technology conference coming up uh, in San Francisco on March 20th. Uh, fantastic speakers, lots of practitioners, and uh, we encourage you to check that out. And finally, of course, a thanks to Fire Apps, just a, a, an unparalleled panel uh, of speakers, and Wolfgang himself, of course. Um, that they uh, helped bring together today. Uh, great thanks to them. We appreciate their continued support and their ability to bring this kind of information and insight to the users of Performative. So finally, I'd like to thank all of you for attending today. I wish you a fantastic uh, rest of your week ahead, and we look forward to seeing you again at another Performative event or at performative.com. Thanks all, and survey coming up. Cheers. <laughs>